Rich Roll here, your friendly neighborhood podcast host. Today on the show, I have the great Dan Harris. What do we talk about? What do we talk about? So much. We went on for a long time. Yeah, we, we talked, talked about, about meditation. meditation. We talked about relationships. We talked about balancing ambition uh, with mindfulness. We talked about generosity. A lot of stuff. All kinds of stuff. So if you're not familiar with Dan, he is a host on Nightline. He's also one of the weekend anchors on Good Morning America. He is the man behind the book 10% Happier, as well as the podcast 10% Happier. He's got a new book out called Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics that you should all check out. And here's our conversation. Please enjoy it. If you like it, leave a comment below and let us know what you think. Ready to do it? Yeah. All right. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for making the time today. Thank you. It was a, it involved a little chat. Where where did you travel from? To well, here's the, here's the thing. I had a little uh, experience confronting uh, my the limitations of my mindfulness today. Because <laughs> I love this. Kind of I story. live in the hills above Malibu, kind oh, of in the far. boonies. I live pretty far away from here, um, and. Uh, started driving here like, I don't know, 1230 or something like that. My plan was to get here, meet Michael here at about 1.30, help him set up, get everything organized. And I pulled into the parking lot here at about 1.15, looked in the back seat of my truck and realized that I left all of my podcast gear at home. Oh. <laughs> I was like, okay, how do I solve this problem? So I call my wife. I'm like, I can't believe I did this. I'm such a knucklehead. Like, I live like an hour away, right? There's no way I'm going to be able to get home, get this stuff, and be back here in time to meet you. (laughs) So I'm immediately reflecting on our email exchange yesterday about where to do this and making sure that, like, I'm all set up when you arrive. (laughs) And so I called Julie. I was like, you got to meet, you got to get my stuff and meet me, like, on halfway or whatever. So I got my stepson to do it. Yeah, she did. She did it. And it was interesting because this is the, exactly the kind of thing that would have just put me into an absolute manic tailspin a couple of years ago. And I'm not saying that I handled it with complete grace today, but I actually kept my shit together pretty well. I was like, okay, this is what it is. Dan's probably going to be there when I get here. I'm not going to be ready to go at 2.30. I'll get there when I get there. And then, you know, traffic started stacking up as I got closer and closer to here with that, you know, the anxiety notches up incrementally with each red light. I was like, okay, it is what it is. So I wouldn't say my blood pressure was at complete baseline, but I give myself like a B plus when normally I would probably get, I'd probably get a D. Yeah, like I this. think that 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 delta between the D and the B plus actually adds up to an A in terms of the quality and quantity of your improvement. I mean, yeah. this is a case study for why you meditate. It's not that perfection will arise because perfection is not on mm-hmm. offer. It's just being marginally but meaningfully less of an idiot. Right. And this story crystallizes the benefits. Crystal. I mean, it's perfect. Yeah. The, the, this thing happens. It's your fault, right? Completely my fault. Right. Which and pushes all my buttons. Of course. Of like you're an idiot. Yeah. Like you don't know what you're doing. Yes. 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 Yeah. It plays into. <laughs> I, I see. I see it. I see it. I get it. Um, and yet, so you didn't handle it like you know you didn't dance through it like Fred Astaire, but you handled it much better than you would have before. That's an A. Yeah. And by the way, it will continue to get better. Not every day, and it won't be a like a straight. It's not a linear. Line. It's thing. not a hockey no. stick, but it it'll gradually just kind of go in that direction. Yeah, I think it will. It will always like regress to the mean, which is probably at that ten percent happier kind of kind of like trajectory that little spike was was definitely above the 10 percent, and and it'll go back down it'll rubber band a little bit and it's not a direct reflection of what i did this morning either it's just a compounded effect of what i've been doing over the last couple years that's right um you mean it's not a it's not a direct just to clarify what you said it's not a direct result of the meditation you did this morning it's just having meditated for a while there's actually a bunch of important things about that you just said uh First of all, the ten percent itself compounds. Now, I don't. I mean, I don't have any mathematical evidence mm-hmm. to back this up, but in my experience, the ten percent happier goes up over time because mm-hmm. it just compounds like any good investment. And the other thing I'd say is um, that it is so important that you point out that it's not a result 
of the meditation you did this morning. And a lot of people say, you know, they end a meditation and they think, well, that was a good or a bad one. Doesn't matter. Right. Doesn't matter. The only question to ask yourself at the end of a meditation, you could have been squirming and miserable the whole time was, were you aware of it? Were you mindful of it? Because you are not training yourself to be better at putting yourself into a mental bubble bath. You're training yourself to learn how to see clearly your own inner chaos so that it doesn't own you. I think that's a really important uh, observation and distinction. And I kind of analogize it to you know, what it's like to train for a race, one of, you know, like one of the races that I do or to write a book. Like yeah. you just, you have to show up for it every yeah. day. And, yeah. some, and sometimes you show up and you feel amazing and you hit it out of the park or the words are just flowing and other days it's a shit show, yep. you know, it's not working yep. at all, but yep. you show up and you show up the next day and the cumulative impact of that consistent application of intention is really the 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 most important factor that's why they call it a practice i mean these are all practices Mm -hmm. and in order to practice anything the first step as you said is to show up right nothing else can happen it's funny because you know when you walked in here today i thought you seemed slightly less ebullient than the original well i was agitated and then when i went to the bathroom i was like he knows i'm agitated like i'm running i'm looping this thing right in my mind he's like he can tell i'm off kilter no no i took it to maybe like i pissed him off by asking him to come all the way out here (laughs) i i personalized (laughs) it you know like i I don't care about that at all oh no but it just tell this is also useful to unpack because this is the way the mind works we can personalize it and say it's the way our minds work but it's really just the way the mind works Every, you know, we're all in our own movie and we're all the stars of our own movie and whatever's happening in other people's movies are is only interesting to us, A, for maybe some mild fleeting titillation or B, as interesting or important because it says something about mm-hmm. our own movie. Right. So you walk in here, you're in a bad mood. Of course, I, I by the way, it, it was totally minor vibrations. It wasn't, of, it wasn't a bad mood. I was just agitated yeah. because of what I had just under undergone. I wouldn't have known you were agitated. I just thought mm, slightly less bubbly than normal. Um, but I immediately just went to, Oh yeah, yeah, it's probably a little annoyed that I had him, you know, come all the way out here to do this. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. I was just hoping I would get here before you so I could get this thing set up before you walk. I got to talk to Michael, your <laughs> new video. Awesome. Call all it. right. Well, let's, let's like, uh, you know, canvas your current situation here. I mean, from my perspective, you have like the world's greatest side hustle going on here. I mean, this is unbelievable. Like you, so you were on the podcast before we shared your story and perhaps we can kind of revisit that in a nutshell just so we can contextualize what we're going to talk about. But while you're, you know, managing this incredibly, uh, I don't know what the word would be, um, high pressure career that you're in of hosting good morning America on the weekends and doing nightline, at the same time, you have this thing going on that for anybody else would, would be an entire career. You've written multiple books on meditation. You've got the 10% Happier app. You have went on this crazy bus tour, and you've become this, like, the public face of mainstream meditation for America or the world in this kind of public health advocacy context. Like, that's a lot. Yeah. you have going on right now well thank you for saying that it is a lot i th- I would say the biggest problem I, in my life right now is time management you mm-hmm. know i just don't have enough time um because i also have a family three-year-old son and a wife who actually came with me to la so we could have a, we live in new york city so she came with me just so a we could escape the three-year-old and right. b we could have some time that's together nice. yeah she's i think at like a spa right now or something oh that's like good that. yes. i enjoyed your podcast with her <clears throat> oh I yes i put her fantastic. on my podcast that- <laughs> you had like some weird trepidation about doing that but i thought it was amazing yeah, I had weird trepidation about it because she knows me. Uh-huh. Like she really knows me. There's no, she actually knows the 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 when the mask is off. I don't wear actually. To, <coughs> I don't wear too much of a mask, but I she mean, knows what I'm like at home. Yeah, for but real. You're, you're very self effacing. Yeah, you know, in your in your writing and in your presentation on the podcast. So you know, I, and that's part of you know that's part of your accessibility and relatability and, and charm. So I don't. It's, it was interesting to me that that seemed to you know sort of alarm you on some low level. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't. I can't control my wife, right? So it's like, and not, not, nor would I want to. But uh-huh. but you know, when I make self effacing facing jokes on a podcast or in a book, it's I'm controlling it. 
my wife's there. She can say whatever the hell she wants, and she knows everything. So that was just a little anxiety. You're not going to get away with anything. No, but it was hilarious, and she definitely gave me all the um, uh, shit that I deserve to to have been given. Right. And she's a very uh, important and interesting case study in the context uh, of this new book, mm -hmm. you know, Meditation mm -hmm. for Fidgety Skeptics, because she herself, despite being your partner, was not sold or at least not on board on a practice level with this whole thing that you're all about these days. No, she uh, I, I asked in the book whether maybe maybe I hurt myself by frequently asking her whether what it's like to be married to your spiritual leader <laughs> yeah that go over well <laughs> no she uh, didn't like that joke no. uh, so but, uh, the irony is she's the one who actually got me started on meditation she mm -hmm. gave me a book by dr mark epstein called going to pieces without falling apart and i read that book and realized that i up until that time i'd been reading a lot of sort of eckhart tolle self-help stuff and what i thought was very interesting because it talked mm -hmm. a lot about Tolle, I think, quite brilliantly describes our ego, the voice in our head, the sort of um, background static of perpetual discontent, as he describes it. But um, I've also heard Eckhart Tolle, in my view, accurately described as correct, but not mm. useful. So he describes our situation well, but doesn't actually give you much to do about it. And when I read Epstein's book, given to me by my wife, I realized, oh, yeah, there is something to do about it. It's called meditation. And... So I started meditating as a consequence of that and then wrote, uh, I've written a couple of books about it and Bianca's lived with me through this period of time. She likes the meditation in that it's made me less of an asshole than I used to be and I definitely had, I retained the capacity to be a schmuck, no, no question about it, but I was much worse way back when mm -hmm. in, in, in a time when she knew me. But she never adopted it herself for a whole complex bully of of reasons, including you know, her schedule and... Um, her sort of somewhat some she had a resistance to self-care which she viewed as a bit of self-indulgent mm -hmm. and then living with me uh, I'm like a a wagging finger personified even though I never I, I don't lecture her about it or I, I did a little bit at the beginning but I learned not to um, she just had a real resistance to it and over the course right, of the book just to like differentiate herself like she's just not going to get on board she just didn't want to do something that she knew I wanted her to do <laughs> That's, That's that. marriage. Yeah, absolutely. In and I'm, I do the same type of thing. Uh -huh. I get it. I, no judgment. I don't actually have any. The only reason I wanted her to meditate was she has an incredibly stressful job. She's a physician. Oh, she, right now she's taking some time off, but she's a highly trained, highly specialized physician. And we have um, a young child. And before that, we had a fertility crisis. Mm -hmm. And she had breast cancer last year. Mm -hmm. So it's been, she's had a tough run and I thought this would be very useful for her, but I knew that if I said anything, she wasn't going to do it. So Jeff Warren, my co-author on the book, who's this brilliant meditation teacher, he sat down with her and he was really able to unlock it for her and in a way that she now does meditate. And what was it specifically that he did that unlocked it for her? A couple of things. Uh, first was he identified something that she identified and something that I had not seen in myself, which is that my practice, my meditation practice, <laughs> I'm, as it turns out, I learned in the writing of this book that I'm a huge hypocrite. I'm always telling people, you know, take it easy. Don't worry about it. When you get distracted, when you're me meditating, it doesn't mean you failed. It's actually the opposite. You, you've succeeded. But in my own practice, I was actually very mean to myself when I would get distracted. And I have a real sort of grit and determination to sit a certain amount every day. And Bianca saw this. She saw that there was a sort of eat your vegetables vibe mm. to my practice. And it was not attractive to her. And so Jeff was like, I see what you see about Dan's practice. Get rid of that. Mm. What I think you ought to do is have a gloriously self-indulgent practice that at the end of the day, when you have put your son to sleep and you come out, I want you to put on some reality TV, turn the volume down low, sprawl out on the ground, and just notice how good it feels to lie down, tune into the physical sensations, and when you get distracted, start again and again and again. He, he called the meditation he created for her Taking Back Lazy, which is a brilliant, brilliant reframing. The other thing he pointed out is that she had... Um, she often is the one... She pretty much always the one who has to put the kid to bed because I work nights and early morning so i'm almost never awake or available right. 
And he's really hard to get down. So she can often spend 90 minutes, 120 minutes in there feeling rage. Mm -hmm. He was like, just in, and when you're lying next to the kid and he's, uh, and you're just waiting for him to fall asleep, just meditate right there. It's, you're already doing it. You're already there. there. So she probably meditates more than anybody I know because she's marooned in this little uh, monster's bed with him and she has co opted that time and turned it into meditation. It's interesting that the, the people that, go out of their way to make their life about caretaking are the ones that struggle the most with taking care of themselves. It is. You know, it your is. wife being a doctor and a mother, um, that idea that, that, you know, you got to put the oxygen mask on yourself before you, before you put it on the kid is so, uh, non-intuitive and, and challenging for, for people like that to literally, because it feels indulgent, I suppose. Yeah. We have a whole chapter in the book about this and Bianca being a primary case study, but we also spent some time as some, uh, social workers, uh, who help kids with, uh, developmental delays right. in, in uh, New Mexico and their problem and as well as Bianca's was, uh, this is self-indulgent. You know, if, if, the five minutes I spend on meditation, I'm thinking, well, I could be with my husband. I could be with my son. I should be cleaning. I should be doing any number of things. And it's just what you said. If you, if you care truly about taking of the, uh, care of other people, you can't do so effectively if you don't take care of yourself. Right. But that, there's that guilt or yeah. even shame you Absolutely. Know, for some people that That's crops right. up that prevents people from, from doing that. You know, I think the, that. the key for somebody like me who's in the position of trying to help these folks is to acknowledge and validate those feelings. I get it. I see the logic behind your rationale, but it's useful in a sort of non-judgmental way to help help folks mm-hmm. see that actually under close examination, the logic doesn't hold up. Right. I see you as like this perfect cipher for the average human being who kind of knows what meditation is, is sort of, you know, tiptoeing around the outer edges of it, but is intimidated or, you know, not so keen on all of the lingo, you know, language. We can talk about the importance of language if you want. Um, and here you are, this person who is, like I said earlier, like, you know, very relatable, um, who speaks the same language as the average human being speaks and is able to translate these principles through storytelling and through science to make these kind of very esoteric ideas um, meaningful in a very practical way for people. And that's like kind of like where you're like this wedge in between East and West, where you could take what, you know, the Buddha said or Joseph Goldstein says and translate it so the bond trader on Wall Street or the soccer mom in Topeka gets it i i really appreciate you saying that i mean i i i kind of think of myself as a gateway drug you know i don't know i'm not a meditation teacher um and there are great meditation books that already existed my only innovation was to add the word fuck a lot you know and (laughs) and uh, and to and to tell very embarrassing stories and 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 to tell stories at all to really turn this to use the skills that i had been uh, that I had acquired in the course of being a TV journalist to to turn it on this um, on on this practice and this tradition of Buddhism. And I sometimes feel like I had this image. I was on a meditation retreat with Joseph Goldstein, my teacher, a couple mm. of weeks ago, and um, I had this image like I'm standing in this vast treasury of unbelievable material. You know, unbelievable journalistic and authorial material uh, co- content and i'm like just taking it taking stuff from buddhism taking stuff from meditation teachers and i'm like is somebody gonna arrest me i get to just take uh-huh. all this stuff but I, I i'm just the right person at the right time i think maybe that i uh, i had all this training as a storyteller i ended up stumbling upon meditation and now i i can just write about it as much as i want there's an endless supply of things to talk about i have in my head five more books that i want to write um, I just don't have the time to do them all right now, but I, w- I would love to. Right. Well, I want to dig into this a little bit more deeply, but, but maybe you can give us like the, the 
20 second recap of how That's you right. got to yeah. this place. So I had a panic attack on, uh, on national television, viewable by anybody who yes. wants on YouTube. How many, how many views does that, does that video millions have Millions and <laughs> millions of views. Yes. I actually don't think it's that bad. Like so, it, it, it kind of, I can see like now that I know this story, when I watch it, I can feel your pain. But if I just stumbled, if I just happened to have been watching it at the time, I don't know that I would have keyed in on what exactly was happening. That's right. That's why my career didn't end that morning. Mm. So I get one of two responses to the the video. Most people see it and they say just what you just said. You know, not awesome, but not that bad. Anybody, however, who's had even a taste of panic and looks at that video, their palms start sweating. It's like a trigger. Absolutely. So uh, I happen to have handled it quite well. Um, I think either because I'm a sociopath or because I, I had the luxury of being able to toss it back to my co-anchors. Mm-hmm. You know, I, was, I was on the air, it was at 7 o'clock in the morning in 2004, and I was supposed to read six stories off of the teleprompter, six quick stories. My job was, uh, that day on Good Morning America, my job was to be the news reader, which they actually don't really do anymore on morning television, but they used mm-hmm. to have people who came on at the top of the hour and just quickly read the headlines. And... As soon as I started speaking, I was overtaken by this big bolt of fear. I couldn't, my heart was racing, my mind was racing, my palms were sweating, my mouth dried up, and most importantly, my lungs seized up. I just couldn't talk. Mm -hmm. So I had to quit in the middle, and I I could toss it back to the main anchors, which if I couldn't have done, that panic attack would have looked much more (laughs) dramatic. I would have ripped the mic off and run away. Mm -hmm. more embarrassing than the panic attack was, was the backstory. So I had spent a lot of time as a young, ambitious, idealistic reporter in war zones, Iraq, Afghanistan, Israel, uh, the West Bank, et cetera, et cetera. And I came home from a lot of these experiences after having had a lot of these experiences and I got depressed and I very unwisely self-medicated with cocaine and ecstasy. And even though I wasn't doing drugs all the time and definitely not when I was working, it was enough, according to the doctor I consulted after the panic attack, was enough to artificially raise the level of adrenaline in my mm-hmm. brain and make me more likely to have a panic attack. And so that kind of sent me off on a long, windy, weird journey that ultimately, several years later, landed me on meditation, mm-hmm. and the rest is history. And, and the rest is history. And now you're, now you're traveling around the country in buses. Yes, talking to, yes, <laughs> yes. Talking to people about this. But importantly, not in a proselytizing way, but in a way of, of just trying to... I mean, evangelizing is the wrong word, but but being no, it's a living, not the wrong word. Being a living example of the benefits of, yeah. of you know, this ancient you know way of approaching life the gospel i think the gospel literally means the good news and that that is basically what i'm trying this is good news the good Mm -hmm. news if whittled down to its essence is that the mind is trainable that all the things we care the most about that we want the most inner peace to use a cliche term but let's just say happiness calm compassion focus gratitude these are skill. These are not factory settings that you can't change. These are skills that you can practice, that you can generate, you can take responsibility for, just the way you can work on your body in the gym, as you do. And that is good news. And so my my whole mission on life, uh, in life, aside from, I, I guess I have three main missions. One is to be a journalist. The second is to be a daddy and and husband. And the third is to tell people this. Right. And I'm just trying to come up with creative ways to tell people, hey, you can, if there are things about yourself that you don't like, you can't magically make them go away. Like I'm still shorter than I want to be, et cetera, et cetera. But you can train equanimity you can train kindness generosity these are these are incre- this is an incredible thing to know and so to me yeah that's a kind of evangelism but importantly to am- amplify the point you were trying to make before that i probably cut you off in, in the middle of is that i don't wag my finger for real like if you're not interested in meditation i'm not going to talk to you about it mm-hmm. i only talk to people about meditation who like you gave me a microphone so i'll talk but i like for years i didn't talk to my wife about it because i knew she didn't want to hear it right what's interesting about what you just said is this idea of news good or otherwise that it's news in the western world this idea that we can train the mind that we can there are things that we can do that we can practice that can amplify our equanimity that can make us more focused that can uh you know reduce the stress in our lives and 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 set us on a trajectory towards achieving all those things that that we spend so much time and effort on in other areas of our life 
to achieve, which is happiness, fulfillment, contentment, mm-hmm. you know, living purposefully, all of these things, right? And we do spend an unbelievable amount of time in the gym or you know, at our job or doing whatever we're doing without any regard whatsoever for how this thing you know, that's sitting on top of our shoulders actually functions. Mm-hmm. We spend so much time on our stock portfolios, our cars, our bodies, our interior design, our resumes, all of which are important. I'm not, I, don't, I'm not, I'm, I spend time on those things. But it's important to spend time as well on the one filter through which you experience everything, and that's your mind. <laughs> and I think this is news. People don't know this. I didn't know this. I mean, I, I, I did not know that any of this was possible. I didn't even know the, I was not even truly aware of the thunderously obvious fact that we have minds and are thinking. And, you know, I mean, yes, I, if you had asked me on the street, do you have a mind and are you, are you thinking? Yeah, I would have said yes, but I, I, I was unaware of the intensity of the nonstop conversation we are having with ourselves all the time. This just chaotic stew of urges and impulses and desires that is your inner life. And when you don't see it clearly, it owns you. And that's all that meditation is. Mm-hmm. It's like a systematic waking, waking up to this reality so that you can surf it rather than be dr- you know, drowned by it. Mm-hmm. And as much as it is news here, I mean, this goes back you know, hundreds, thousands of years in the yeah. East. Like, this Millennia. is not news in no. you know, a, a large part of the world. Uh, we're, we're, the, we're late to the party on yeah. this. And what's interesting is that science has now sort of caught up to this trend to verify it in a way that legitimizes it to the rational, you know, logical way that we as Westerners kind of perceive the world. I mean, that's what allowed me to get over the hump because I was, I mean, to the extent that I had ever even thought about meditation, I thought it was ridiculous. I mean, you know, I often joke that I thought it was, you know, for people who live in a yurt and are really into Enya and Cat Stevens and, you know, live in a, uh, spend time on a Himalayan mountaintop in loincloth. I mean, just, you know, the, all the cliches. But it was the science that changed my mind. My wife's a scientist. Both of my parents are scientists. I was not good enough at math to do science, but it carries a lot of weight with me. When I saw the science that suggests that it can lower your blood pressure, boost your immune system, literally rewire key parts of your brain then i thought okay this makes sense and and importantly for me as somebody who's struggled with anxiety and depression um as well as panic and substance abuse this the science around anxiety and depression is actually the strongest Mm -hmm. and i just you know in testing it in the laboratory of my own mind it became very obvious that when you can have some distance from your repetitive grim thought patterns your neurotic uh, programs, you know, inner neurotic programs, then, then they don't control you as much. And that's what depression and anxiety consists of. Maybe we can uh, go in a little bit more deeply on, on what the science actually does say sure. and doesn't say. <clears throat> so one thing to say about the science first is that it has been and continues to be regrettably hyped. So I think people overstate what meditation can do and they latch on to every hot new study and and then there's some breathless headline about how meditation can, you know, make you dunk on a regulation hoop or whatever. It's just not that that is not the case. I, I think it's important to point out that the that the studies, that the research is in its early stages and that, while we can't say much definitively, what we can say is it strongly suggests the research strongly suggests that meditation can confer a number of really attractive mm-hmm. benefits from uh, as I said before, lowering your blood pressure, boosting your immune system. It's been shown to help with grades in school, behavior in school. It's uh, been shown to help with anxiety, depression, cog- age-related cognitive decline, um, ADHD. Uh, um, and the neuroscience is really the most exciting stuff. That re- right. I'll just give you one study that was done at Harvard in 2010 or 11. They took people who had never meditated before, so just civilians, and they scanned their brains to get a baseline reading of what their ba- brains looked like. And then for eight weeks, they had them do a little bit of meditation every day. And at the end, they scanned their brains again. And what they found is that in the area of the brain associated with stress, uh, the gray matter literally shrank. And in the area of the brain associated with self-awareness and also compassion, the gray matter grew. That is just really compelling. And it's also shown to, to, uh, to um, 
uh, have a salutary effect on the areas of the brain associated with attention regulation. Mm -hmm. And another one, last thing I'll say about this is uh, there's a connected, there are a series of regions of the brain known as uh, the default mode network. These are the areas of the brain that fire when we're in our default mode, which is thinking about ourselves, thinking about the past, thinking about the future, just kind of ruminating. Um, that's just the, that's our resting state as humans. Meditators, while meditating, that area of the brain, go, the activity goes way down. And importantly, for long-term meditators, it goes way down even when you're not meditating. Mm. That's, that's pretty compelling and amazing. Yeah. Yes. I feel like we're in a very uh, tenuous, interesting time. I mean, there's a lot going on right mm -hmm. now. You know, we're in uncharted waters politically uh, and particularly with respect to emerging technology. Mm -hmm. There is a war for our time and attention mm -hmm. afoot. And, and maybe there always has been. But with the advent of all of these devices that are vying for, you know, vying for our eyeballs, I feel like, you know, we, we have to be, we almost have to be um, practicing some form of meditation to avoid the compulsion that we all are faced with, with just pulling the phone out of our pocket every day and looking at it. Like, I don't know about you, but I can go down the rabbit, like, I'll be scrolling through Instagram and I'll be like, I can't stop scrolling. What is wrong? What is wrong with me? And then, and I realized like, well, you know, a lot of time and attention and millions of dollars were put into this app to, to achieve precisely this result that they're achieving with me. And I have to go above and beyond and exercise like, you know, a lot of mindfulness and restraint to like create rules around these things and avoid them so that I can actually move forward in my life. Yeah. In other words, we're in a period where boredom need not exist ever again. Yes, yes, we are yes. so overstimulated mm -hmm. and there's a lot of amazing things about that, but you know, we're in, in many respects, we're prisoners, right? And so if you start to think of it in that context, what are the tools to unlock us from this prison that we've, that we've all volunteered for? I ha interviewed recently a very interesting person named Manoush Zemrodi, who she hosts a podcast called Note to Self, mm -hmm. and it's all about sort of our relationship to technology. And she said, and I'm probably going to mangle the quote, but that we're in a essence conducting a huge science experiment, so global science experiment about our attention and our relationship to mm -hmm. these to these devices because we're just we, we don't know what it does to us we know some things but um we just don't really know what the long-term effects are of having this supercomputer in your pocket and just being glued to it all the time my view and i'm open to change but my view right now is that you know these are incredible tools and they're so useful and so delightful on so many different levels but it's very important to try to create a healthy relationship yeah. to them. So I'm not, I mean, I, before we started rolling here, I um, was talking about how I went out and splurged on the iPhone 10. I mean, I, yeah. I, I don't, I'm not anti-tech, but I am anti-unhappiness. Uh, and I find that having a mindfulness practice, which essentially just boosts your self-awareness, right? Through having increased self awareness because of meditation, I, I notice more quickly when like I'm just I'm I'm doing this because I'm bored. Mm -hmm. I'm doing this because I'm lonely. I'm doing this. I'm I'm drowning in Twitter and I'm my stomach is roiling and my head is pounding because I'm upset about some political development. Step away, man. And that has really helped me. Um, so it's not to say that I never use technology. It's just that my relationship to it has become more healthy. And then the other thing I'd say is that. I love that there's this proliferation of meditation apps out there right. because it it's like co-opting the engine of our distraction and turning your phone into something that teaches you how to be mindful. I think there's a reason why these companies are doing so well. Yeah, it is. It's super interesting. And, and I can kind of contextualize it or analogize it to to, uh, you know, recovery from substance abuse because. I see my own denial mechanism creep up like, oh, well, yeah, I'm, I'm on Twitter while I'm waiting in this line because, you know, my career is tied to social media and I need to know what's going on. And I, it's like, it's bullshit. 
you know, I don't need to be doing that. Like to, but to be able to catch myself in that argument and have enough self-awareness to say, that's just a lie that I'm telling myself to, yes. to validate this behavior that I know, you know, deep down is not in my best interest. Yeah, it's just seeing it is a huge victory. But I can always go on the 10% happier, happier app instead, right? <laughs> I mean, I <laughs> Which would I'm argue... on board with. It's really cool. Like, I, I think it's... You did a really great job. Thank with you. It. And, you know, I, I was um, on Headspace for quite some time. And I, I know Andy, and I, I think they've done an amazing job yes. there. Pioneers. Yeah, incredible, right? Incredible. And what you've done... I was always, you know, curious before you launched your app, like, oh, well, what's he going to do that, that they're not doing? Or how do you differentiate... And I think you've done an amazing job of creating something unique and different that also, you know, serves the same ultimate goal uh, with the video and the various different teachers. And, and, you know, it's really and it's it's fun. You know, it's not it goes to that thing that you said earlier, like this transition that you went through from that period of time when you wrote 10 percent happier when you were looking at meditation like your vegetables or just something that you have to like, you got to do it. You got to like get through it or whatever to something that you look forward to. That's enjoyable. It's funny because, well, first of all, thank you for saying all that because the app has become really just a major focus for me. It's, it's just my baby. And, um, and I had no prior experience in business, uh, but luckily was able to through a long series of events that you probably don't care about, find this amazing team. And we just are having so much fun doing this thing. Um, but, you know, in terms of making it fun, I come from morning television and I often think, you know, weekend Good Morning America, which is one of the shows I do at, at ABC, um, our success in the ratings is because if we, we yes, we give you the news, we do all the things that you, we check all mm -hmm. the boxes. But the five of us who are on the show, we love each other. We're having a great time and it feels like a party that you want to be at. And I want the app to feel that way, that, uh, that it's not just dry meditation instructions. When you watch the short little video clips that we serve up all the time right before you sit to meditate, although you can just meditate if you want, but if you watch the video clips, it's fun. It's super practical. It's me sitting with some brilliant teacher or scientist, and you learn something that can actually change the way you live, uh, but also have fun doing it. To me, that is just such a... I don't know. It's just an amazing experience. Yeah. It's cool how Jeff ends the sessions by saying, uh, you know, welcome to our meditation cult. Now go <laughs> kick ass in your day. You know? <laughs> As opposed to like, namaste. Yes. Uh, so we, uh, you know, our little slogan is no, no, pan, no pan flutes. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we just, the, the, the way meditation has been delivered is either dry or twee or super like, addressing you as if you're, you're grasshopper mm -hmm. you know that we're trying to avoid all of those tropes and just stick with what this is which is secular simple exercise for your brain but also as soon as you start just like you were talking about when you're online at the supermarket and you see you're checking twitter and then you're engaging in all of these sort of crazy rationaliz rationalizations that's hilarious when you look at your mind it's fucking hilarious because mm -hmm. it's crazy it's totally crazy if you can't have a sense of humor about this you are in deep trouble. And I think that's what we're trying to bring to this thing is uh, it's not that you're going to conquer your neuroses. It's, it's that as, as one great meditation teacher has said, you'll become a connoisseur of your neuroses so that said so that they don't have so much power over you. Yeah. And just to break it down um, and make it super accessible and simple so that anybody can follow it. Yeah. Um, and to use language that people understand. I mean, we kind of danced around this earlier, but, you know, the importance of the importance of language with ideas like this. And you've sort of famously said, like, you know, meditation is, you know, is in the greatest need of, of like rebranding or like a new marketing strategy, because the idea that like, like I'm just envisioning two guys watching Monday night football, sitting next to each other and one leaning over to the other one and saying, you know, how's your loving kindness practice? Going? It's like, it's not going to happen. Right. And yet these are profound practices that we can all benefit from if we, and I think guys, you know, have a harder time with the language than, than women do for sure. But you know, two guys watching Monday night football might say, you know, uh, how's your CrossFit class? Right. Sure. So, but this is exercise for the mind and the brain. And there's a reason why the Chicago Cubs meditate. There's a reason why Novak Djokovic meditates. Mm -hmm. The U.S. Army and the U.S. Marines are spending tens of millions of dollars on meditation for the troops for a reason. This is us up. It's, 
these are bicep curls for your brain. And, and there are lots of different practices that can work on lots of different mental qualities that you care about. We just need to start talking about it this way so that it's not embarrassing to talk about it at Monday Night Football because those guys deserve this practice just as much as the traditional yogis who've been doing it forever deserve it. Everybody mm -hmm. deserves it. This is our birthright. Mindfulness is our birthright. Having a mind is our birthright. And so we, this should be done by foster care children. This should be done by inmates in prisons. This should be done by patients in hospitals. Nobody is outside the scope. You've been doing this for a while now. Uh, and, and your initiation into this was you know, very much about like trying to reframe it and redefine it for yourself. But as somebody who's now been around the block and has gotten to know all these amazing teachers and is very steeped in the, tra the various traditions, et cetera, do you find yourself at times, uh, like nothing static. So I would imagine your relationship with this is, it's certainly more profound and different than it was when you began, but do you find yourself kind of gravitating a little bit towards the patchouli crowd in a way that you weren't initially because i'm just thinking like i analogize this to when i adopted a vegan diet like i was like i'm never going to be vegan because those guys kick hacky sacks and have <laughs> dreadlocks and talk about things that i'm not interested in you know like it, and now 10 years later like i kind of have become one of those guys a right. little bit you know in a way that i never would have thought not by conscious design but by evolution i think it's such a great question. The short answer is not really. Like, I, I'm not as offended by it as I used to be. And so it, I can be in the room when people are, you know, talking the talk. But I still am pretty offended by it. I don't like, uh -huh. you know, like when Jeff and I were writing this book and we, we did some. So we did straight up mindfulness practices in the book, but we also did some as you said before, loving kindness practice, which I have a whole rap about. We can get into it. Uh -huh. But we so we did some uh, practices that are designed to boost your compassion. And I told them, don't use the word heart because that's just, what does that even mean? It's just kind of sappy. So I still have some linguistic peccadillos um, and uh, little rules uh, that I like to stick to because I think there's a way to talk about this that makes it less annoying. But I am now way in the tank for meditation and I regularly go on meditation retreats mm -hmm. and have a deep relationship with a uh, this amazing meditation teacher, Joseph Goldstein, who's, in my view, perhaps the greatest living meditation teacher. Um, and uh, so it, it's, it's, I'm in a funny place catering to skeptics while I meditate two hours a day personally and go on these long meditation retreats. And it is, that is, you put your finger on a tricky balance for me, but I haven't really given an inch on my firm convictions about the right and wrong way to talk about the practices. Yeah. As a translator. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, and that, that's certainly, you know, that's your, that's your place. That's your talent. That's your, that's your role. At least as you, as you see it clearly, like everything you do is, is a way of translating these ideas to, to the average person. Uh, that's my goal. That yeah. is definitely my goal. Is it really two hours? You're doing two hours a day. Yeah. So a couple of years ago, maybe two and a half years ago, I got it in my head so not long after 10% Happier came out, I just got it in my head that I really wanted to go deeper. The logic being not that I, you know, the, the, I guess the, the way to describe the logic is it's demonstrably true in my experience and based on the science that you can train yourself to, to be kinder and more mindful and more focused and all these things. So if you can be 10% happier, what's the ceiling? And I've become very interested in what's available at the sort of deeper end of the pool, not only sort of as a journalist, because I plan to write about this at some point, but also as a human, uh, you know, I saw so many benefits. So, for example, one way to think about this is like with exercise. So I, kind of, you know, I, I like being fit. I got to look at my stupid face on television. So I try not to be overweight and I. I'll go, I, my wife and I went to Soul Cycle this morning, and um, and I, I work six six or seven days a week. I work out. You run these crazy like Ironman things, and so I, I would never do that. Um, but 
I don't think you're crazy because you do. It's just that you personally got so interested in it that you wanted to take it further. That's kind of what I'm going for on the meditation side. Although any serious meditation, like really serious meditation person knows that I personally am not yet a meditative triathlete, but I am making the be- my, my best attempts to move in that direction. So about two and a half years ago, I, I had it in my head that two hours a day was the, the right number. I don't know. It's, mm-hmm. it's kind of... It's kind of out there that two hours is a, a number that a lot of dedicated practitioners do. And I heard from my friend, Sharon Salzberg, uh, an amazing thing. She had a friend who, Sharon is a great meditation teacher. Right. And she, She's not on the podcast. Oh, okay. So yeah. your listeners know her, That's which is amazing. She is amazing. She had a friend who wanted to do two hours, but was very busy. And he came up with this rule of, I can do whenever I want, wherever I want, and whatever increments I want throughout the day. And so now that's my rule. I just, I wake up in the morning. I don't know when or where I'm going to meditate or for how long. And I just fit it in where I can. And and that by the end of the day, I get to two hours on a great day. I'll bank a little bit for the next day Mm -hmm. on a shitty day. I'll like come up short and have to make that up the next day. So today, for example, I've taken a lot of cars around LA and, you know, lift I'm in the backseat of lift cars and, um, I've got a lot of time to meditate, and uh, so I'll probably, I owe 45 minutes from a couple of weeks ago. I'll make it up today. Yeah, interesting. And how long have you been doing the two-hour experiment? Uh, almost three years. Oh, three years. Almost wow. three years, about two and a half, three years. And what yeah. is the qualitative difference um, in your life between that and the more typical, you know, 20 minutes a day or 20 minutes in the morning and 20 minutes at night. I just think it's, it's taking the, the benefits you get as a beginner and ramping them up. It's not that I'm, you know, in some bubble of bliss, you know, with like bulletproof imperturbability or anything like that. It's just that. So what are the three benefits you get as a beginning meditator? Increased calm, increased focus and less emotional reactivity. I just turned up the volume on all three of those. The other thing I've noticed is that my actual practice is better. This is a skill. You know, people sit down to meditate and they find immediately that they're super distractible, uh, which often people assume that's a failure, but it's not. I've just found that actually my ability to focus has gone up over time and sort Mm -hmm. of more and more interesting and pleasurable things happen in meditation. And when unpleasant things happen, I'm actually able to be equanimous in the face of them. Not all the time, but at, at a much higher level than I used to be. Well, certainly, you know, the, the, the proof is in the pudding in terms of like your productive output. I mean, the fact that you're, you're a host on two different television shows, you're writing books, presumably you're traveling all the time to speak and you're doing things like podcasts. You, you have your own podcast at the same time. You've got this app, like you're doing, (laughs) and you're a dad and you're, I mean, that would just blow the mind of the average human being or create so much anxiety that it would become an unsustainable situation. Yeah, I, I have a suspicion that, that that has to do with meditation. It's funny, I've only recently started to think that because there was a long time where I was doing the two hours and it was a bit of a stunt. I was thinking, because I, st- I want to write a book about enlightenment at some mm-hmm. point. So I was kind of at my initial instinct was a little crass. It was like, okay, let's see, let's see what happens. Like kind yeah. of in an AJ Jacobs kind of way. Absolutely. Like a, yeah, right. I actually yeah. thought of um, that. I, maybe there's a book called "A Year of Living Dharmically." You know, uh-huh. like because he wrote a book called "A Year uh, of I'm Living Biblically." Live right, but, um, I but I realized that first of all, I don't want to do it just for a year. I want to. This is the way I want to live. Um, and so my interest isn't. I, this isn't actually just stunt journalism. After a while, I started to realize that this is. I, I actually want to be doing this level of practice, if not more, and. Um, and I actually have come to believe, and I, I, I don't have any evidence to support this, but I have, to come, I have come to believe what you just described, that this kind of crazy workload has become, I, 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 is enabled by the fact that I do have this practice that gives me the ability to stay focused when I need to stay focused and also to um, not suffer as much, you know, like suffering in the Buddhist sense. You know, the Buddhists describe suffering as just clinging to things you want and pushing things away that you don't want lacking any equanimity in the face mm-hmm. of life's in next, you know, inevitable vicissitudes. And I think I've gotten a little bit better at just kind of being more supple in my dealings with, uh, reality. Um, that isn't to say I'm perfect cause I am definitely not. Um, but I, th- 
I have this suspicion that this practice, which started as a bit of a lark, is really helping me do all the things I want to do. It's multifactorial, though, because I think another part of it is just flat out greed. Not necessarily greed for money, because, you know, like I don't make any money off of the, um, I don't get paid by the app. Um, you know, we're a startup. Um, but greed for, like, lust for, I'm, I am, I have doing all the things I love. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I love being a journalist at ABC News. I'm so, I've been there for nearly 18 years. I, I love ABC News. It's such deep relationships there. So much gratitude for the amount of experience, uh, the experiences they've given me. And just, I love the people at Nightline I work with and Weekend GMA. I just absolutely love it all. And then the writing these books and having this company and a podcast, I can't get to hang out with people like you. This is an incredible opportunity. And then having a family, we, you know, we had a huge, as I mentioned before, infertility struggle. And so I just do not take for granted my three-year-old, even when he's pooping on me. Um, so all of this is just, a, there's just a, there's a greed just trying to wring out of life everything I can. And also navigating your wife's breast cancer. It was a, that was brutal, man. I mean, she's, she's okay now though, right? She's cured. Yeah. She's great. Wow. And, um, but look, I mean, I, to state the blazingly obvious, she was a thousand times worse for her than it was for me with a lot of very painful surgeries and a lot of fear. And, um, but I will say that that practice, particularly the aforementioned loving kindness practices that we haven't yet fully excavated, but maybe we will really made a difference. You know, I'm squeamish. I'm selfish. I am, uh, not by nature, nurturing mm -hmm. and uh having a baby around the house and a wife who was as sick as she was, was a big challenge for me and um you know i found it actually in the end it really was i heard bianca say recently that it was the best thing that ever happened to her getting sick that way wow. and i would say it was also the best thing that happened to our relationship that we just I really had to, she's always been the caretaker. She's a doctor. She's actually naturally very, very compassionate. We're a bit yin and yang in that way. I'm a little more sort of aloof. And um, I had to, you know, really step up. And I found that I, I don't want to say enjoyed it, but I found a lot of meaning uh, in engaging in that way. And her gratitude stems from being able to reprioritize yeah. her life? Yeah, as she says, she was just kind of hurtling along in this high-powered medical career and parenting and a husband who's just nonstop. And the breast cancer really made her stop mm -hmm. and take stock. And she's in the middle of this process of taking stock. But she is, for the first time, really taking care of herself. Um, she's gotten really into Soul Cycle. I mentioned mm -hmm. we went to Soul Cycle this morning. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on your yeah, yeah, yeah. candid thoughts on Soul Cycle. But no, it's but, great. Look, uh, anything that gets anybody excited about being active yeah. is a good thing. So I was actually very down on Soul Cycle because I used to do other forms of spin and that I thought were much harder. But then I realized actually I was doing Soul Cycle wrong. I was that I wasn't actually rhythm riding. That other forms of Soul Cycle are uh -huh. actually uh, other forms of spin are like go this fast at this time for this many seconds. Soul Cycle is actually just about riding to the rhythm mm -hmm. with enough um, uh, resistance so that you kill yourself that way. Right. And so I, it took me a while <laughs> to figure it out. Uh -huh. um, and so we do that together. We have a, and I, it's so great to watch her take care of herself after years of not really taking care of herself, mm -hmm. uh, so meditating and exercising in these ways. So I think it's been really good for her and good for us. That's amazing. I want to get back to you know this, this sort of contentment that you were expressing you know, that you get to do all these things and you have this very big life. Uh, you know, it's, it's almost intimidating to like talk about all these different things because it is, it is like for the average person that would be anxiety producing. Like, oh. How are you going to manage all this <clears throat> stuff? And uh, like, but I crazy, have anxiety right? just so you know. Okay. Uh, like, okay. yeah, you're, you're okay. You're a human being. Yeah. Glad to hear that. Uh, but I think it, it begs the question of happiness itself. Like, mm -hmm. you know, the first book memoir, uh, sort of, you know, an argument in favor of meditation dressed up as a memoir through storytelling. You know, you make this compelling argument about the benefits of meditation. The title is 10% Happier. Like, what is happiness? And, and how do you think about happiness um, in terms of, of, you know, a way of living? Or how does that kind of um, line up against other ideas, comparable ideas like contentment, fulfillment? Um, living purposefully, living mindfully. 
I have a whole rap on this. So the, 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 those other words are more specific and truly more meaningful. Happiness is just, the reason why I chose happiness or happier is, is because that's the word we use more frequently, but it actually doesn't mean much. Um, and in, fa in fact, if you look, I think I might have said this in my first book, that the very roots of the word linguistically, etym etymologically, re reflect our cultural ambivalence about the subject. Hap, H-A-P, is the same. It's like haphazard, hapless. It means mm -hmm. luck. So happiness is like something you luck into. Uh, and in fact, as, as discussed before, it's a, before. That's, it's a, that's super interesting. it's really interesting. Yeah. So when in fact, happiness is a skill. I spent a lot of time um, asking happiness experts like meditation gurus, you know, how do you define happiness? Mm -hmm. And nobody ever gave me a satisfying answer until Dr. Mark Epstein, who I talked about before, who wrote, who, who wrote the book that really got me interested that in meditation. That was your entry point. Yeah. Um, Do, Mark and I were having dinner, and I asked him, well, how do you define happiness? And he said something to me that was not meaningful at the time, but I've come to believe that it is the smartest thing I have heard about happiness. He said, more of the good stuff and less of the bad. Okay. What does that mean? I've come to think about it in kind of geometric terms. I'm terrible at math. But if you think about, uh, psychologists have uh, this theory called the set point theory. So if you think about um, a graph, it has an X axis and a Y axis. The X axis runs horizontally. So the set point theory is the X axis. It's a kind of like, you, we all have a ha happiness set point. So good things can happen and we, you know, our happiness level goes up and then we tend to revert back to our set point, the X axis, the sort of straight line. Mm -hmm. And then bad things happen to us and then our happiness goes below the set point, but eventually we were kind of revert to it. That this is, this is a, a theory about the way we are as humans, that we have this kind of happiness set point. In my experience, that, that sounds right, but that what happens with meditation is that the top end of that graph, the way you are when good things happen, gets taller and more sustained because you are more, you are enjoying in, in, a, in a more fulsome manner the for lack of a less cheesy word, blessings in your life. And you're not so busy running, rushing off mm -hmm. to see what the next hit of dopamine might, might be. So that's the top of the graph. And then the bottom of the graph is when bad things happen to you. I think through the meditation, it's like it become, the bottom half becomes shallower, that you're spending less time in useless rumination and you're kind of recovering more quickly. And then meanwhile, I think the set point itself moves up. And to me, that's how I think about happiness is uh, uh, how ca are you navigating life's ups and downs? And are you getting the most out of the ups? And are you maximally resilient in the face of the downs? Yeah, I've heard Sam Harris, your friend, talk about the, the kind of half-life of negative emotions yes, being brilliant. reduced. Right. Yes. So, you know, whether you're... Can I have this? Yeah, of course. That's, I got that for you. Uh, whether you. you're, you're angry or you're resentful or you're, you're looping in your mind some you know, insanity that the half-life is much shorter. It will dissipate and go away. It's among, Sam is a, a valued friend of mine and he has said many brilliant things that I steal. That is one of them. He talks about one of the benefits of meditation having to do with the half-life of anger. That, you know, you, we still are going to experience difficult emotions. Um, unless you're enlightened, mm -hmm. if you even believe in that. Um, and I, I don't know if I believe in it. Um, I don't know. You've got to write this other book. Yeah, I am going to write this the other book. The Pursuit of Enlightenment. Yes. Um, uh, we are still going to experience negative emotions. The mystery of consciousness is we don't know where our thoughts and feelings come from. They come out of a void. Mm -hmm. You can't, which is liberating to know because there's no point holding yourself responsible. You did this today. You, you, uh, got angry at being angry for forgetting your pod, your audio equipment at home and started telling yourself a whole story, mm -hmm. which you caught yourself doing, but you did do it anyway. And we all do this. We have a feeling, you know, impatience with our child, impatience with our spouse, whatever. And we tend to get into these knots of self laceration around. I'm this kind of person as a consequence of having just had this feeling. We didn't invite the feeling. It just came out of a void. We don't know where mm -hmm. it came from. So you can't hold yourself responsible for what you feel, but you can hold yourself responsible for how you deal with it. And so when anger ambushes you, for me, I, I deal with a lot of anger. Um, 
if I can see it, if I have an inner meteorologist that can tell me when the storm is brewing and is about to hit landfall, make landfall, then it, I may either let it pass and not be taken over by it, or I may get a few miles down the road with it, you know, a couple minutes of doing something stupid, but then I catch myself. The, the, it, the amount of damage, as Sam says, that you can do in two minutes of anger as opposed to an hour of anger is incalculable. Right. And that is the fruit of meditation, which is why I was so jazzed about the story you told at the top of this podcast, cause, because it epitomizes what the value of this practice is. The beginning part of that um, for me is understanding that there is a distinction between the thinking mind and you know your I don't know what you would want to call it your higher consciousness your awareness having awareness of the thinking mind being the observer of the thinking mind and that kind of like duality right that these are two stuff. different things yes which is kind of a mind blow I mean you can go down the rabbit hole on that forever it's kind of a mind-blowing thing and it begs the question of you know what is consciousness and mm -hmm. what is our minds and <clears throat> you know what is actually going on here like how do you think about that kind of stuff i mean you just put your finger on perhaps the most interesting question facing mankind you know this is the fundamental mystery what is mm -hmm. consciousness we know that we know stuff in other words you know what it feels like if you're driving right now you know that your the feeling of your hands on the wheel you know that you're thinking but what knows it <laughs> right <laughs> try to find the little rich roll in your head you rich or whoever's listening try to cl close your eyes but don't close your eyes if you're driving and try to find you you, you won't we don't know what knows but it's, does that mean it doesn't exist i think the argument that gets made and this is where it gets into the deep end and I'm in some ways sort of insufficiently qualified to talk about it so anybody who is qualified and hears me talking about it I apologize in advance but I think what the Buddhist would say is that this gets into the illusion of the self mm -hmm. that we which is the primordial lie we are telling ourselves we think there is some core rich in us some core Dan in us and all of our negative emotions that is the wellspring of all of our negative emotions because we have greed to gratify the inner rich we have hatred to defend uh, our whatever we have we have you know and then confusion about reality as a consequence of embracing this lie um but the simplest way to think about this is um uh there is a difference between your thoughts and your awareness of your thoughts so uh, the thoughts or emotions or anything you're aware of are like actors walking onto the stage right? They pass through or clouds going through the sky. Your awareness, your consciousness, you just is the stage or it is the sky. If you want whatever analogy you want to use. So we don't know what the sky is in this analogy, or we don't know exactly what the stage is. And you can get into lots of discussions about what it is, but for just your rank and file meditator, that doesn't really matter. The only interesting thing to the most practical thing to be aware of is that there is a difference between your raw bare awareness of things like when you're just uh, feeling the sensations of your butt on the chair that is just plain old awareness then there's thinking about the feelings of your butt in the chair man i gotta do more exercise my butt is too big those are just thoughts that's a different thing and well none of these are things actually which is an interesting idea but the more that you self-identify your awareness with the actors on that stage the yeah. more that you will suffer absolutely and the more that you can to the extent that you can transcend that um self-identification and 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 kind of step into a more expansive understanding of oneness the more you can free yourself from the chains of of that cycle of suffering. Yeah, I think it's just like, um, to me, it's like interrogating the mystery a little bit. If you can do this little exercise, which is a Buddhist exercise that, Tibetan exercise, um, you know, close your eyes and hear whatever sounds are there, you know? There's all sorts of sounds. My voice, maybe the little tape hiss, whatever. And then ask yourself, what is hearing this? And you won't find it. But in the not finding, as the Buddhists say, there is this kind of liberation because you're not, you're seeing how, you're seeing the mystery, the fundamental mystery 
of your own identity and of our existence. Mm -hmm. And that can disidentify, disentangle you from all of the suffering that we're creating of just being so entangled with our thoughts and, and our stories and all of that stuff. It's not magic and it's not permanent unless, again, you're enlightened. Um, but it can in just moment after moment. There's this kind of theory in meditation circles of short moments many times that uh, if you just kind of are touching this mystery over and over and over again it has the net effect of making you lighter uh and and pushing you closer toward enlightenment whether you believe that's a mm -hmm. thing or not as beautiful as that sentiment is the prospect of of really confronting that in yourself is terrifying because we're, so? we're sort of raised and taught to to um you know identify with these stories that we tell ourselves about who we are. I am this per I am Dan. I am a journalist. I am rich. I am whatever. Right. And we, we craft these narratives around identity that we delude ourselves are real. And so to kind of engage with what you were just talking about is to kind of dismantle that yeah, in, but the, in a certain way. Yeah, that's right. But there are two ways. There are two, the Buddhists talk about this in a way that actually is comforting, which is to there are kind of two levels to life, two levels to reality. There's the relative truth. You know, you still are rich. You, you know, on the day to day basis, you know, even if rich doesn't exist on some deep level, you still you still have to put your pants on in the morning mm -hmm. and um, you still need your podcast equipment if you want to do a podcast. And that that is just the truth on a sort of relative on one on the on the level in which most of us operate on which most of us operate most of the time but there is a deeper truth which they often call ultimate truth which is kind of uh, it can be roughly um analogized to quantum physics so like this table that you and i are doing an interview on is a table but at the deepest level it's a bunch of spinning atoms in empty space and so the same is true with the self and so you don't need to get you don't need to get too wrapped up in this. Mm -hmm. It's just uh, it's just a, it's a it's a useful thing to think of in so much as it can help you not get so wrapped up in your own stories. Well, I think this is a good kind of place to launch into talking a little bit about the obstacles that people have yeah. to embracing um to embracing meditation to begin with, which is really the heart and soul of this new book, Meditation for Fidgety um, Skeptics, because as, as I understand it, like, uh, you know, I was going to ask you, like, you know, why, why write this book? Mm -hmm. But, you know, I already know the answer to that, which is that you were under the impression that writing the first book would state this case for meditation, then everyone would read it and then adopt these practices and, and live happier lives. <laughs> And you were sort of surprised that that was not the immediate, despite this being, this book was a huge success, right? Like that was not the reaction yeah, that you. It was not the reaction you know. I got. I mean, I, I, um, first of all, I didn't think anybody was going to read it. I was like, uh, my view was I'm like a B level network newsman writing about something at the time that was pretty n niche. You know, meditation was, you know, it was, it was, had some cultural capital, but it wasn't wasn't super hot mm -hmm. as hot as it is now um so i just didn't think anybody was going to read it yes it, it ended up becoming pretty successful uh, which was delightful and amazing probably the most one of the most consequential professional developments of my life and so gratifying uh but it was humbling to see that it didn't have the effect because you know i actually on 10 percent happier i didn't set out to write a memoir i initially was going to write a how-to book Mm. But then the memoir parts of it were the only parts that anybody that was reading it liked. <laughs> well, that's not true. I mean, it's the it's the story that allows people to emotionally connect yeah. with you so that they can hear the other part. R right. But I didn't I didn't I, I mean, I only put some uh, like a few pages of how to stuff way at the back of the book. Uh -huh. And I got a very interesting phone call from a friend of mine, Daniel Goldman, who uh, he wrote a seminal book called Emotional Intelligence, and he's a big meditator. And mm -hmm. he called me up and he was like, this is great. It's so cool that you're getting so people excited about meditation, but you, you do have some responsibility to actually teach them how to do the thing. Mm -hmm. And that was a big kind of, uh, uh, that set me on my heels. And, and I had to really think about, well, okay, what, 
what should I do? Uh, so the first thing I did was I ended up co-founding this company called 10% Happier. We have this meditation app that we've discussed and it's been incredible, incredibly fun to do this. And I've also learned a lot. And one of the things I learned as being part of this company is uh, while being part of this company is, is, um, that there's this rich pageant of neuroses that stop people from meditating and, or, or embracing any healthy habit. And, um, so that is why I wanted to write mm-hmm. this book. And, but I didn't want to write a dry meditation manual uh, because I didn't think anybody would read that. So I decided to do it as a story. So I rented this big orange tour bus previously occupied by Parliament Funkadelic. Right. And we went 18 states in 11 days. Me and Jeff Warren, who's this meditation teacher from Toronto. And, um, and we met all of these different people at all, you know, all these different stops, cops, politicians, celebrities, social workers, and you know, use them as case studies for each of the eight main obstacles we identified. Uh, so the book is trying to do three things at once. It's like a fun story of this gonzo road trip. It also is a systematic classification of all the obstacles to medica- meditation and, and then answers about how to surmount them. And it's a how-to book. Halfway through the, writing the book, when I was tearing my hair out, I was like, oh yeah, so there's a reason why nobody's written a book like this before. <laughs> This is really fucking hard. hard. <laughs> but what's great about it is that it is a fun story because it's a it's a it's a like a bromance road trip. Mm-hmm. Like you and Jeff hit it off. You guys develop this amazing relationship, <clears throat> and and you embark on this adventure together. And you know hilarity ensues. Yeah. And along the way, we learn lessons and we yeah. learn how to meditate. And you kind of are able to quantify all of these reasons or, or these barriers that people throw up that's preventing them from accessing this tool that has been so transformational in your own life. And it begins before you even go on the road with your own coworkers and, and staff, which yeah. I thought was yeah. really like instructive and hilarious to see that like these people that you work with and you've had this, you know, epiphany in your life. And yet they're mm-hmm. like, they're on a totally different page with this stuff. My co-anchors at good morning America yeah. on my weekend. So we have this little, you know, tight knit group at, at uh, weekend GMA because we're the sort of weekenders, you know, not, not the A team and, but we really love each other and we have, you know, we're up early together on the weekends and we just got very lucky that we, they, the bosses t- put together a bunch of people who really have close relationships and they make fun of me for being the meditation guy all the time, but they all have interest in it, but aren't doing it. So I brought in Jeff, who I call the meditation MacGyver to see mm-hmm. if he could help them get over the hump and we had this hilarious session where these people who just never shut up um, and their jobs require them to never shut up like dead air is the is the, the thing we all fear you know trying to get them to sit quietly and meditate was right. a real challenge and one of them paula ferris who is my uh, my work wife she's my co-anchor on the show the co host we're the two main hosts of the show she literally I, she did something I've never seen anybody do before she turned the meditation the actual guided meditation into a call and response she was interrupting <laughs> Jeff and asking him questions like a lot of questions we, they were good questions and Paul is very very smart so um, it was they were useful questions but I'd never seen anybody sort of break protocol in this way uh-huh. um, and it was interesting because, you know, after, as a, uh, partly as a consequence of this session, you know, Paula is now a pretty regular meditator. That's really cool. And she had a different idea for the title of this book. Yeah, right? she wanted to call it 10% Less of a Douchebag. <laughs> or 10% Happier But Still a Douchebag. Yeah, 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 something yes, like yeah. that. <clears throat> she she, she refers to herself as the little sister Dan never wanted. Uh-huh. <laughs> But God, anyway. Yeah, she likes to torture me. But how brilliant is it that, like, you have, you know, you have this whole other life in this meditation world but you have this you have this platform where you can yeah. go on national tv yeah. and like talk about it it's, it's like kind amazing. of an amazing thing it's such is such a, a friend of mine wrote me a note the other day saying um you know congrats the book seems to be doing well congratulations i was like dude i have a minor advantage which is that the, uh-huh. the one of the largest <laughs> media companies on earth uh-huh. is like this full-throated backer you know my bosses at abc have been just like irrationally supportive they're just like, you want to start a company? Great. Mm. You want to do a podcast? Great. You want to uh, write more books? Awesome. We'll help you promote them. Uh, I, they're just incredible. I That's mean, they're amazing. absolutely incredible. Because yeah, they could have just shut it down and said, absolutely. look, we need your full attention on, totally. on what we hired you to do. I mean, part of the deal is they know that I work seven days a week and mm. I'm so super committed to ABC. And um, uh, so, I mean, I have to pull up, I have to 
do my side of the bargain, but you know, they have been amazing. And I think, I think there are a lot of reasons for it. Um, you know, just the depths of the relationships that we, that I have at the company, the fact that my bosses happen to be just very cool. Um, and also that this is a healthy message to be putting out there. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just good for everyone to be promoting it. I mean, it'd be different if, I don't know if I was writing like how to pick up ladies or something, you know, you know, something. Right. It's a public wholesome. service. Yeah. It, it, it behooves ABC to recognize that and embrace it. I think so. I think mm -hmm. so. And, you know, like there are a lot of people at ABC who are into meditation, you know, uh, George Stephanopoulos, mm -hmm. Robin Roberts, Diane Sawyer. There are a lot of people there who are on board. And I think that has helped as well. Yeah. Do you have like secret behind the velvet rope, like <laughs> top level ABC, like executive washroom meditation no. session? <laughs> no. No, but I did do a, yeah. a private thing with the staff of Nightline the other day because, mm. and it was so interesting because we have a very tight knit staff, very um, heavily, heavily female, and um, they're all like RoboCops um, in the, in the sense that that you know like. It, it, RoboCop was like a cop in, invented in a lab who could do everything perfectly right. well. These people, these women, mostly women, although some men too, they can shoot the stories, they can produce the stories, they can write the stories, uh, uh, they can do it all. And there have, there's an enormous amount of stress in what they do. And to sit and talk to them about the stress and how they feel the stress actually, this is another thing we tackle in the book, they feel like the stress is necessary to do the job. That, right. that if they don't have the stress, they'll lose their edge. And it was really interesting to talk to them about how actually, no, there are ways to manage the stress so that you don't wear down your resiliency and energy. Um, so that was a really useful private session with my team. It was nice. Yeah, I think... I think that is a, a, a really is a big one with a lot of people. It's certainly a big one with me. And the way you kind of break the book down, it's it's divided into sections that address each one of these objections. And we don't have time to go through all of them, but I think that's one of the ones that that is 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 one worthy of exploring a little yeah. bit because as somebody who's ambitious, who's, you know, in certain respects, you know, has alpha tendencies, I have developed this idea that my self-will and my workaholism and my ability to kind of focus and go the extra mile is in certain respects a secret weapon. And I've had to learn the hard way that it is a very unsustainable source of energy that leads to burnout, that you know unduly fatigues me, um, and that ultimately makes me a difficult person to be around mm -hmm. and generally unhappy. Mm -hmm. And so although there's a dopamine charge that comes with that that's very addictive, having to learn a new way of approaching my work that's more balanced, um, that, that, that involves more equanimity, to use your word, uh, has been a challenge, but ultimately is leading me in the direction of, of creating a more sustainable, productive way of approaching what I do. So a number of things to say about that. I mean, you just articulated a psychology that I run into a lot and one that I dealt with personally as I was adopting this practice. Um, you're not wrong. The, the, the will that you describe, the grit that you describe, the motivation, creativity has been a secret weapon for you. I mean, you look at what you've achieved. Um, that, that doesn't happen uh, just by being, you know, perfectly equanimous in the face mm -hmm. of everything that arises. You know, like you, you've got you to gotta have some yeah. get up and go and you have it. And that has worked to your advantage. At some point, there is diminishing returns. Mm -hmm. And the self-awareness you generate through meditation can help you see, oh, okay, so <clears throat> the 97th time I launch into a perseveration loop around the audio quality on that last podcast, does that, does it make any, am I help? is this useful? Mm -hmm. Is this useful? Probably not. If you notice, you know, to spend a little time worrying about uh, whatever issue you're worrying about makes sense take action, do what you can to fix it, let it go, move on to the next thing. That kind of rabbit hole of useless rumination just wears down your energy, wears down <clears throat> your resiliency, makes you unpleasant to be around, none of which gets you further toward your goal. But meditation, again, the self-awareness, the mindfulness that, that we generate in meditation, which can help you pull yourself out of the nosedive, is what allows you to have a more balanced, effective approach. But that is not to say that stress has no, you know, has no role. Mm -hmm. I think if you want to do anything great, plotting and planning, wringing of hands is part of the deal. And you mentioned before the, the, the 
the, the scope of my personal responsibilities, my professional responsibilities, it does create anxiety for me. And there are times in the writing of this book, I talked about it in the writing of this book, my wife had to do a little intervention because I was just totally burnt out. I was trying to write a book on top of everything else I was doing. And I just took it too hard, too fast, too far. And, and I, she had to st- take me aside and be like, dude, you can't like fall asleep with the pages of the book yeah. you know, in your hand and then have macabre stress dreams as a consequence. And that made a big difference. But so it just goes to the final point I wanted to make as it pertains to to you, which is that you, you talked about how you're, you know, you're sort of moving in the direction of having a more balanced approach. I would just give yourself credit because you can't snap your fingers and just have the idyllic balanced approach that you have in your mind. It's going to be about kind of vectoring toward it Mm -hmm. and having failures along the way and then learning from those failures. So you're doing the thing. It's just, it's always going to be a messy process. Yeah, it's it's definitely messy. <laughs> yeah, tell you yeah, that. and I'm sure if your wife was here, we would get a whole story about how messy it is. But that's cool. That is absolutely cool because there is no other way to do it. Mm-hmm. The other objection that I really connected with um, is this idea. Uh, it's one of the ones later in the book. Later in the book, um, you know, blank is my meditation. Mm-hmm. Like you know, everybody. It's like as an athlete, like I've I've been that guy. who's like trail running is my meditation, or when I'm out on my bike. That's my meditation. And I would imagine there's other people who, you know, oh, Netflix, you know, when I get home at night, that's my meditation. And it took me a long time to understand, and I think we talked about this when I was on your podcast, um, the difference between, there is a meditative aspect to some of the training that I do, but that's not meditation proper. That there is a qualitative distinction between an active meditation or an activity that is meditative and formal meditation practice. Can I just say that when you were on my podcast, that was one of the most popular podcasts we've ever done. Oh, cool. Thanks, man. You're the man. Um, uh, so, yes, we, a, a, amen to what you just said. Um, I hear all the time from people, uh, you know, knitting is my meditation mm-hmm. or run, pr- running is the big one I hear. Running is my meditation. Yoga is my meditation. <clears throat> my answer to that is always maybe, you know, I mean, I'm, I can't rule it out, but mindfulness meditation is a specific thing mindfulness meditation is paying attention to whatever you're doing so let's just step back for a second running yoga knitting any of these things can be mindfulness meditation but you have to do it in a specific way which is to pay full attention to what's happening so if you're knitting you're feeling the the weight of the whatever i don't know how to knit but the little chopsticks that you hold while you knit you're Uh feeling the weight of them you're feeling the movement you're making conscious movements and then when you get distracted which you will a million times start again and again and again mindful running would be uh and i've done this um it's actually hurts much more than running the normal way where you're you know rehearsing some argument what you want to hurl at your boss or you're listening to a podcast or music but mindful running is headphones out you're feeling the physical sensations of the movement, uh, the pounding of your feet, the wind on your face. Mm -hmm. Uh, Then when you get distracted, you start again. Uh, Same thing with yoga. Um, Most people don't do the aforementioned activities in the way I just described them. They do it, they're letting their minds run hither and yon. By the way, that's not a bad thing. I think running and knitting and yoga all have really important health and psychological benefits just the way you've always done them. But I wouldn't call them mindfulness meditation unless you, you add on the tweak that I just did. Yeah. If you, if you bring that level of intentionality to any action activity that you're participating in, then I suppose, yeah, it could be, but if you're just going, like I'm running and I'm, my mind's just doing whatever it's doing without giving it any thought or putting any of that intention into it, then that's, that's not meditation. Doesn't mean it's not a good thing to do. Right. It's just not meditation. Right, right, right. So, uh, we live in divided times as somebody who is in the news uh, and is, you know, your career is about kind of navigating the daily cycle of insanity that we're all immersed in. Um, I, I'm interested in your thoughts of how to help, how to, how to kind of navigate and deal with um, the day in day out you know, cycle of news that I think is making people crazy. 
Yeah, so I, I, I think there are a number of ways in which meditation can be useful um, now. One is use of social media. So the self-awareness that's generated through meditation can help you see when you're just like, oh, I've been on Twitter for four hours and my stomach is upset and my, um, you know, my chest is buzzing and um, you know, I'm just vibrating with rage. That, that is a signal, like if you're tuned into those signals, that it's time to step away. The other is... I had that, not to interrupt you, no, but I just, I just had that experience yesterday. I got all caught up in the Jake Tapper, Stephen Miller interview saga. I went down the rabbit hole and like watched the video and read the articles and then read the articles about what happened off camera and all this stuff. And I got really agitated by the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And I had to finally say like, what, why am I even doing this to myself? Like, what am I, what value am I getting out of engaging and learning about this? I think you got some value because it's important to be an engaged citizen. And then the mindfulness, your training kicked in and you saw that you had reached the point of diminished returns and you pulled yourself out. Mm. Textbook application of mindfulness. So that's one example of how mindfulness can help in the current atmosphere. The other is when we're experiencing the kind of rage, frustration, helplessness, hopelessness that many of us feel in the face of current events, uh, we can, those emotions can drive us to do a lot of un you know, unhealthy things, stress, eating, snapping at people. So the kind of, again, back to the self-awareness to know when you're super angry because of something you saw on the news this morning and you're carrying it out mm -hmm. through the rest of your day. And, you know, in your case, maybe eating too many cacao nibs or whatever it is you vegans eat. <laughs> um, I so, was, by the way, I was planning on bringing you a green smoothie, but I, I, I got all caught up in my crisis and couldn't make that happen. I, you so. changed my life because <laughs> you, I, for, I, we have your cookbook and uh, not infrequently uh, cool. we'll dive in and the plant power way, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, but also you told me one day, I mean, uh, you, after you came to my office, the first time we met, you, I was hungry, and you, uh, you, you had come to my office to interview me for the podcast, and I didn't even know who you were. Uh, now I obviously know who you are, and you, you said, go get a smoothie with um, kale, spinach, banana, blueberry, and almond milk. And I went, and it was like, this is delicious. It sounds disgusting, but it's actually totally That's delicious. Good, right? It gives you a ton of energy. Sometimes I'll add in avocado. Um, so, yeah, so instead of binging on food or snapping at your, you know, venting your spleen at your opinionated uncle, uh, meditation can help you sort of not let, not be so buffeted by the, uh, the sort of noxious uh, nature of our political age. And then the third thing is have you that, no, Let me just ask you yeah. this, though. Have you noticed a change in your, as somebody who's like, you're in, the, you're in this yeah. as much as anybody in the mm -hmm. world, right? Have you noticed a difference in how you process that information or, or the kind of news diet that you put yourself on or how you react to the, the vicissitudes of the cycle? So the truth is that I'm more tuned into the news than I've ever been. And I find myself, I'm really following the story and I'm very concerned, very concerned about the polarization. And I'm I'm very concerned about lots of things, mm -hmm. but mostly the biggest problem, the root of it for me is how we're at each other's throats and we can't even agree on a basic set of facts That's to the frame thing. the discussion mm -hmm. and that is so unhealthy um there's a total breakdown in our ability to yes. communicate in yes. a healthy way yes so i would say that leads me to the third benefit and actually there's one more so four the third benefit is that i think mindfulness again the self-awareness that you get through meditation can help you see your own biases and there's actually something satisfying about noticing oh yeah are you happy every time Mueller appears to be making a uh, moving closer to the White House? Or conversely, do you have a coffee mug emblazoned with the words liberal tears on the side of it? You know, are you... How dug in are, are you? Like, yeah, are you a tribal? Mm -hmm. And are you part of the problem? I think we are all part of the problem. And if you can start to see that, then you can do what I would recommend and what I have come to do, which is to have a really varied media diet. And so I consume the mainstream media, the so-called mainstream media, including ABC, uh, New York Times... 
But also, I listen to liberal podcasts and I listen to conservative podcasts. And I find that seeing the world, you know, you can go from listening to Morning Joe to listening to Ben Shapiro. And it's like you're in a different universe. Right. And, but it's, I think that's very healthy. And, um, seeing, and seeing where your own biases are can be just as interesting as catching yourself, on, as that you described earlier, catching yourself online mm -hmm. at the supermarket justifying how you need to be using Twitter. Twitter, th th this can be a rich field for exploration. And then the fourth area that I think meditation can help is the loving kindness meditation, which we've dis kind of discussed, which is basically there's this f other form of meditation that's often taught in conjunction with mindfulness, where you systematically cultivate good vibes. You sit, close your eyes and envision people uh, you know, somebody you're close with, somebody you don't like, some, a neutral person, et cetera, et cetera. And you send them silently these phrases like, may you be happy, may you be, uh, live with ease, et cetera, et cetera. It sounds like Valentine's Day with a gun to your head. And it is super annoying at the beginning, but there's a, there is a lot of science that suggests that not only does it have a lot of health benefits, mm -hmm. but that it actually can change behavior. Mm -hmm. Kids, preschoolers who are taught loving kindness meditation are more likely to give their stickers away to kids they don't know having a preschooler at home i that is a big deal yeah. and um so i think at this point in time in fact i think my next book is going to be about these practices i think the title that i'm working on is 10 percent nicer uh and the subtitle is the self-interested case for not being a dick uh -huh. and there is a self-interested case that mm -hmm. when think about this when you hold the door open for somebody what does that feel like in your mind if you're paying attention? It feels good. That is scalable. Compassion, generosity, kindness, these are skills that you can work on and would make a huge difference in the age in which we find ourselves right now. Yeah, selflessness when perpetrated from for, for selfish reasons only still works. Yes, That's yeah, it does. It's a beautiful thing because <laughs> yeah. somebody like me who's not naturally altruistic, if you turn it into, if you show me the science that suggests you could live longer, you could be happier, you could be more popular and more successful, which is what the science suggests about kind people. Um, if you show me that science and then you give me some practices, even if they are a little annoying, I will do them. Mm -hmm. Because my motivation is, I want the the popular, happier, healthier thing. I want all those things. Right. It's so it's so counterintuitive, and it and it goes against all the messaging that we're constantly yes. exposed to, yes. which is that our happiness is wed to you know getting the Tesla or the new house or being able to go on this vacation, when in truth, it's completely accessible by extending yourself selflessly to another human being. And by the way, I got nothing against the Tesla. Like, I would love to have a Tesla. I would, I would love to, too. That's why I always use it as an example, because I'm thinking about it too much. So <laughs> so that, it yeah. isn't to engage in a whole self-flagellation cycle around that. It's just to see that actually on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, the happiness of being kind to yourself and others is perennially available. And... Just, just try it out. You know, don't take my word for it. That's the way the, the Buddha's approach was like, don't take my word for it. I'll teach you a bunch of things. Go and do it. Test it in the laboratory of your own experience. And so I'm just telling you, I've tried it. It does work. Doesn't mean I'm never an asshole because I'm definitely still an asshole time, at times. But when you're mindful enough, you can see what does it feel like when you're an asshole? It feels like shit. Mm -hmm. And that powerfully disincentivizes you, you know, powerfully disincentivizes you. Um, yeah. All right. Well, we got to wrap this up in a second here, but but before we do that, what are you like what are you working on now? Like what is emotionally? Like what is what's your biggest stumbling block or or what is you know, what's what comes up for you in your practice as a recurring issue that you need to like work through? The biggest change to my practice came from Jeff Warren, my co-author, diagnosing in the course of spending 11 days in this tin can traveling across the country together, he diagnosed that I have a lot of inner antagonism, <clears throat> that I have the potential that while I can be an asshole externally, most of it is self-directed and that my meditation practice had a, had a real grim quality as a consequence that as mm -hmm. I, t I discussed this earlier, that I'm always telling people, you know, when you get distracted, it's no big deal. But when I got distracted, like I, you know, somehow I was operating on this theory that 
I'll win at meditation. I'll never get distracted. And then I would engage. <laughs> in, yeah. Type A. Yeah. Yeah. What a, what a schmuck. And so I was engaged in all this self laceration internally. And Jeff helped me inject a huge dose of sunshine into my practice by. He, 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 he had an idea that I thought was really cheesy and I rejected it like I do with all good ideas initially. I'm like the anti-blink. Um, you know, blink is about the wisdom of our, our you know, intuition. rapid fire. Uh, my, my, my rapid fire intuition is always off. So Jeff's idea was, look, when anger arises for you internally, like name it after your asshole grandfather, Robert Johnson, who you got it from. So when it arises, be like, hey, what's up, Robert? Mm. And, and I thought, that is dumb. That is corny. But after a while, I started to realize, actually, and this is because Jeff pointed out to me, there are five or six kind of neurotic programs that are, are always running for all of us, that are running, uh, that sort of uh, compete for salience in your mind at any given time. So for me, anger, logistical planning, ambition, uh writing like creativity um and there are a few more and i've forgotten them right now but i gave them names mm -hmm. so like goofy little names like so robert johnson for anger sammy for my ambition after the book what makes sammy run uh which is about an ambitious hollywood type uh julie the cruise director for uh, julie after julie the cruise uh -huh. director for the love the book love for the book. logistician um arthur which sounds like author for every time I like do some writing in my head and depersonalizing it in that way, making it lighter and literally saying the words, welcome to the party. Mm -hmm. When I see the arising of these neurotic patterns has just lowered the temperature in such a constructive way. And it's made me see that all the sappy talk about being kind to yourself, you have to be kind to yourself, blah, 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 which I also dismissed, is totally true. Mm. And that my whole meditation practice has just become a much more congenial place. And when I close my eyes to meditate, you know, and I see, I actually sometimes smile when I see my anger come up or when I see, you know, my ambition overtaking me and I'm carried off on this train of you know, planning world domination through meditation. Like, oh my God, I see there's pleasure in seeing it. And so Jeff is a, Jeff is, Jeff is a hedonist and I lacked hedonism in my practice. And, um, now I have it. And it's a massive gift that he's given to me, even though, as I write about in the book, there were many times when we wanted to murder each other. Right. Well, I would imagine part of that derives from, the fact that now, you know, for better or worse, like you're the meditation guy, like that, that's how people see you. And I'm sure people stop you on the street and say, Hey, it's the meditation dude, <laughs> you know, and, and, and the pressure that that probably you know puts on you a little bit <laughs> to, you know, kind of monitor your behavior and like, Oh, well, if you freak out and get angry at somebody, you know, how do you, how do you like, you know, walk your talk in the, in the best way possible, um, is can be without, you know, it could be like an unhealthy relationship that you have with yourself. Right? Yeah, it could be. I, I, though I think that, that, frankly, for me, it wasn't really that. It was just, it was just this. I have this conditioning that that veers me toward anger. Right. You know, my my grandfather Robert Johnson is a real person and not a nice dude. Mm. Oh, later in his life, he actually became very nice. Um, but most of his life, I remember one time um, he in the 80s or something like that he got his first vcr and he took me and my little brother and to see it and he said if you touch this i'll break your arm mm -hmm. that was the, you know that was the kind of wow. dude he was and like i have robert johnson in my veins and yeah. like and there have been many times in my life and to this day where i am capable of very cutting comments and uh most of it though is self-directed and um jeff just saw that in me uh, you know, there's benefits being locked up on a bus with a brilliant meditation teacher. Yeah. Interesting <laughs> shit that you may not want to face uh -huh. will be dragged out of your subconscious and, and, and presented to you. And that's what happened. I like that idea of giving all of these qualities names, though, and recognizing that they exist rather than trying to deny their, you know, that they're, they're even. It, yeah. it reminds me of... Elizabeth Gilbert, right? She wrote about this in her book, Big Magic. I yes, read that book, I but have. like she, when you go on a creative endeavor, you know, your, your, whatever that voice is that talks you out of your self-worth, 
not like to not pretend that it doesn't exist. Like, okay, we're going on this road trip. You can come, but you got to sit in the back seat and you can't pick the music and mm -hmm. you can't tell, you can't mm -hmm. give directions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's sort just a similar idea. The, the, the weapon may not be the right word. It's like a nerf weapon, you know, the sort of nonviolent weapon we are equipping you with here through meditation is just seeing clearly when you see this stuff, it can't own you. And so there are all these little techniques that we use, you know, and, and coming up with goofy names for your inner dramatis persona mm -hmm. is uh, one of these techniques. You don't have to do it, but I found it to be very useful. And bringing it back to the book, you know, in terms of techniques, I mean, it's broken down in such simplistic terms like, you know, anybody can do this. I mean, literally, there is if you read this book, uh, you will learn how to meditate and you will you it will be so accessible and so, uh, you know, easy to incorporate into your life. And I think that's one of the, the great kind of like gifts of this message that you put forth in the new book. Thank you, man. I appreciate yeah. that. Because the, you have like these chapters, but then you break it down at the end and like, here's the here's how we're doing it. And it's like, oh, that's very elementary. Like, I get it completely. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be some major ordeal where you're giving me 200 things to think about and tasks to do. It's just very simple. That's that was the goal. I mean, it, it was very hard to get there, um, but that was the goal. Make it as user friendly as possible. Simple, simple, simple. And also tell you an engaging story in the process. Right. So for somebody who's now listened to us for 90 minutes and is thinking, all right, I'm sold, I'm on board, uh, other than getting your app and getting the new book, what's a way to just launch into this and begin? Look, the uh, this is going to make me the worst, shittiest businessman in, of all time. Um, I, will, I love selling books. I love having people subscribe to the app. But the basic instructions are really basic you know sit in a reasonably quiet place close your eyes if you don't like having your eyes closed you can kind of keep them open just a little bit and stare at a neutral spot on the floor second step is to just bring your full attention to the feeling of your breath coming in and going out pick a spot where it's most prominent your nose your chest your belly and the third step is the most important because as, as soon as you try to do this your mind's going to go crazy you're going to have all sorts of random thoughts. Where do gerbils run wild? Whatever. Blah, blah. What kind of bird was Big Bird? Whatever. Blah, blah, blah. And then the whole game is just to notice when you become distracted, start again and again and again. Those are the instructions. This is the way they've been doing it for millennia. You don't need a book. You don't need an app. Mm -hmm. You just need your mind and your breath in a reasonably quiet place. And if it's not quiet, just put some headphones on. You could do that one minute a day. Truly, one minute a day daily ish so like most days and i think you'd start deriving a lot of the benefits that we've discussed from meditation it helps to have support in the form of a teacher if you like to go to a local class or an app where you have a bunch of teachers like ours or there are lots of other good apps as well it also makes me a shitty businessman but it's true um or reading a good book these can all be very helpful tools but the basic instructions are just what i just described so just play that back to yourself and go sit for a minute and do it. Set a timer on your phone and go do it. Mm -hmm. Good talking to you, Dan. Always a pleasure. Yeah. Huge pleasure. Thank you, man. I appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for doing it. That was awesome. Uh, definitely pick up the new book, Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics. Download the app, the 10% Happier app, available wherever you get your apps. Listen to the podcast. The temper You've done a good job with branding here. 10% oh, yeah. Happier yep. podcast. And, uh, you know, turn your television on and you're sure to... Catch him on ABC. Thank All you, right, brother. Man. And it. At, at Dan B. Harris on Twitter, right? Yes. And yes. website 10percenthappier.com. Yeah. There you go. There we go. All right, man. Good Thank talking you. to you. Likewise. Peace. Peace. Namaste. Namaste. <laughs> Peace and plants. As much as it pains you. Peace, plants. <laughs> Namaste.